When they said soul music is timeless, this is what they meant. Music in its purest form, music that comes from deep, music that connect your soul, your spirit, music that connects us emotionally, soul to soul. There's a perfect song for every situation and every season. There are those songs that no matter how many times you hear them, they'll always hit as if you heard them for the first time. And there are two parts that make it special, delivery and its lyrics. The lyrics is the most important part, it is the original message that needs to be given the breath of life, and that's where the delivery comes in. Delivery in form of the voice and the instruments, they have to be perfect for the message to be conveyed effectively. What if I told you that the reason you deeply resonate and connect with some of your favorite songs is that they are actual real-life experiences? Ever heard of this? You What about this? Sunshine, blue skies, please go away. What if I told you these were not just songs written to fit the narrative? What if I told you these songs were actually a true story of not just by anyone, but of the lyricist behind the songs? Who, you ask? Roger Penzabaini, one of the best lyricist Motown Records has ever had. Many might not have heard of him, and that's because he allegedly took his own life on New Year's Eve 1967 at a mere age of 22. And the reason behind this was the heartbreak after finding out his wife had cheated on him. Surprisingly, there is more than meets the eye. His story is not all black and white as it has been made to be. But before we go deep into this, let's first get to know who this 22-year-old was and why his name is still mentioned decades later, despite being in the industry for a few years. Roger Penzabaini was born in 1945 in northwest Detroit near Eight Mile, in Michigan to parents John Penzabaini, a steward, and Anna Cindy, a stay-at-home mother. He was of Sicilian and Irish descent, and not African-American as it has been assumed by some. It is said that as a kid, he was the jovial, the extroverted type, and always good at everything. Whenever he met his cousins over at their maternal grandparents in Brockway, Pennsylvania during the holidays, he was the clear standout amongst them. No one could dance like him, no one could play the piano like him, despite him never taking any piano lessons. And it's because he was a Detroiter, the vibrant city full of life. But as he grew, he in some way became laid back, but was very active in music. As we all know, during that time, being involved in music in Detroit was inevitable. And in the process, he made a number of friends, friends that would shape his future in all ways. Among them was the legendary guitarist Cornelius Grant, known for being the music director of The Temptations at some point, and often known as the Sixth Temptation. And the other, Helga Christiansen, someone who'd grow to be more than just a friend. Both of these special people also attended South Sea Mumford High School with him. Back to Cornelius Grant, the Texas native taught himself how to play a guitar from the age of nine. At 13, his family moved to Detroit where he met Penzabaini, who lived just four houses from him. The two became acquainted and became best of friends from then. According to Grant, Penzabaini was kind of quiet, but was a prankster and in some way had a weird sense of humor. Anyway, by 15, Grant had already started playing with local groups at many of Detroit's clubs and music venues. While playing with a local band called the Staccatos, he met Motown producer and songwriter Henry Cosby, Henry would introduce Grant to Motown after Mary Wells' guitarist was drafted into the army. Grant became a backup guitar player for singer Mary Wells, and later after an impressive stint, serve as lead guitarist and music conductor for singer Marvin Gaye. His prowess would push him to the moon after he was taken in by the Tempting Temptations, becoming a valued member from 1964, serving as guitar player, musical director, and live show arranger. With such accomplishments from Grant, he became a star back in his neighborhood. And as a result of this, Roger's mum bought Roger a guitar, where he started learning, in a bid to become like his best friend. And with Grant always on the road with the temps, every time he came back, Roger would be the first to meet him up, excitingly showing him some new lick he had been learning while he was away. And that's how the two began to work together, coming up with songs too in the process. Even though Penzabaini's interest was to be a guitarist like his friend, 
He found out he had a hidden talent, and that was in composing the lyrics. He had all the time in the world to compose songs while Grant was on tour, and this gave him room to stretch his creativity levels and to perfect the art. With this new path for him, and determined to impress his best friend, his creative mind led him to the perfect source of his lines, his young wife Helga Penzabaini. You see, Roger's love goes way back, back in Mumford, where the two met. At that time, Roger was singing and Helga was writing music. With time, they became fond of each other, and Roger proposed to her, much to the dissatisfaction of his family who were against interracial marriage, just like many white families at the time. But Roger decided to follow his heart and went ahead with the marriage with the two having two kids later on. Roger Jr. born in 1965 and Carl in 1967. Back to music, he decided to source inspiration from his real-life relationship with Helga, someone who had changed her life in many ways, among them helping him associate freely with the many talented African-American youths in the hood. Helga also seemed to be the only person that understood him, with many, even members of his family, finding him odd. And it is to no surprise that he blew up shortly after choosing their relationship as a source of his writing career. His early works with Grant include Gladys Knight and the Pips hit Take Me in Your Arms and Love Me, Temptations Save My Love for a Rainy Day, and also I'm Glad You Belong to Me by Matha and the Vandellas, which was released over 10 years after being recorded. But it was a special song by The Temptations that put his name on the map. It was during the time that David Ruffin was mostly the lead vocalist of the group. Everyone loved him as his unique raspy and anguished tenor vocals, coupled with injecting emotions to the lyrics, got their utmost attention. However, Grant noticed that when Eddie Kendricks took lead, the girls just swoon. With this, he requested Penzabaini to write a song best suited for Eddie's first tenor voice, citing the reasons why. Roger, looking at his wife and what they had been through together, came up with the Temptations hit You're My Everything, a song that served as a testament to his love for his wife. The opening lines of the song tells you everything you need to know. You surely must know Magic Girl, because you changed my life. It was dull and ordinary, but you made it sunny and bright. Now, I was blessed the day I found you gonna build my whole world around you. You're everything good girl, and you're all that matters to me. The song reached number three on the US R&B chart and number six on the US pop chart. What made this masterpiece special is how Eddie and David's contrasting voices meshed together so perfectly, not forgetting the tight backing. This marked his entry into Motown, where he worked with the likes of Norman Whitfield and Barrett Strong, composing songs for various Motown stars. It is also during this time through him that his wife also got to join Motown as a lyricist too. However, this move proved to be costly to him. Helga was young, and just like any other young girl back then who came into contact with the Motown greats like The Temptations, Marvin Gaye, The Four Tops, and many more, she got carried away. And with this came trials that proved she wasn't strong enough to overcome. She started cheating on Penzabaini behind his back. It, however, didn't take long before Roger found out. This completely changed the trajectory of his life from then. How could she do that to me when we promised we'd be faithful till death do us apart? Roger couldn't take it. He was hurting, broken, and this incident robbed him the will to live. He became secluded, his introverted side magnified, and would always sought to solitude to hide the pain. You see, Penzabaini was known to be laid back and with somewhat low self-esteem ever since he joined Motown. On the other hand, Helga's excitement opened the portals for the devil to exploit. Twenty at the time, she was from a modest northwest Detroit family background cast into the glamorous Motown lifestyle and was full of energy. In the process, she became weak from the law of attraction towards a 22-year-old Penzabaini, who in her eyes didn't have the confidence like the Motown stars. And the mistake that they did of settling down so fast and at a very young age, without fully getting to know each other, and also, the fact that the union didn't quite get the blessings from the parents was coming back to bite them. On top of this, the fact that Roger, through his Italian roots, romantic and affectionate, was one of his strongest personalities, while Helga, an African-American, grew up at a time when the girl had to toughen up to survive. They were not vibrating on the same energy levels, and with their naivety in marriage, 
They didn't quite know that to coexist, they had to compromise and sacrifice for each other. It is said, even after Roger took back Helga after she had the affair, the broken trust with time overshadowed the forgiveness, and the two ultimately separated shortly after. The breakup crushed him. However, as hurt as he was, he continued to honor his contract with Motown and also his friendship with Grant, and just as before, expressed his feelings through the lyrics. He first composed You Don't Love Me No More by Gladys Knight and the Pips. Still sticking to the thinness of hopes that they could still work things out, he first composed Save Me From This Misery, recorded by the Isley Brothers. Oh, I'm in bad shape since you've been gone. I lay in bed and cry the whole day long. I can feel my mind beginning to crack. Gotta find a way to get you back. I don't want a loneliness to be my destiny, baby. Save me from this misery. He followed it up with the temptations I wish it would rain, which many believe to be as his main mournful breakup song. Sunshine, blue skies, please go away. My girl has found another and gone away with her went my future. My life is filled with gloom. So day after day I stay locked up in my room. I know to you it might sound strange, but I wish it would rain. Oh, how I wish that it would rain. He followed this up with I could never love another after loving you. He composed Jimmy Ruffin's Don't You Miss Me A Little Bit Baby. But from then, for some reason, he decided to take a sabbatical before resurfacing with the final song, The End of Our Road, done by Gladys Knight and the Pips. Fast forward on the December of that year, 1967, the clouds were gathering, and what was about to hit him, no one had an idea. His best friend Grant vividly recalls Pennsylvania's final days with him, and the encounter will always remain etched in his memory. Prior to that, the Temptations had recorded the vocals to the song I Wish It Would Rain back in August, where he noticed a withdrawn Roger when they heard the acetate of the track playing, despite him trying to cheer him up by telling him how the song was going to hit, and he would finally get a bachelor apartment and the whole bit, also forgetting about his personal troubles. Instead, he was so taken by the Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band, in which he listened to the whole album. Motown had just released the hit on December 21st, and The Temptations, scheduled to perform at the Latin Casino in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, were busy packing up their station wagon in front of Hitsville. A sad Pennsylvania looked at them from a distance and even went an extra mile to tell Grant that if he had his way, he would have gone with them. Grant told him he could go with them and even offered him to give him his room until his wife Carrie, who had gone for Christmas, arrived. But Roger, after a moment of consideration, declined the offer, and that was the last time the two friends ever saw each other. Ten days later, on New Year's Eve, it was reported that Pennsylvania allegedly took his own life by shooting himself on the heart area of his chest, putting an end to a somewhat troubled life. It took everyone by surprise, with even his best friend not able to read the signs prior. As the years went by, Reports from his younger son, Carl, claim that they later found a note he had written prior to his death, apologizing to his family and close friends for what he was going to put them through, but this has never been substantiated. Representing the Temptations, Otis Williams had this to say about him. We liked Roger a lot. He was young, nice-looking, but kind of quiet and reserved, and very humble. Ironically, the inspiration for these great songs was his unhappy personal life. He was 22 years of age. He would shortly after be buried at the Holy Sepulchre Catholic Cemetery in Southfield, Oakland County. But before we point fingers at the wife, before we throw stones at her, this story goes deep and there's definitely more than meets the eye. With an in-depth research from the internet, thanks to the likes of Brad Laidman and Adam White's official websites, who did more than a good job in covering this, we came up with three possible scenarios that could have led to the demise of this prolific lyricist. Keep an open mind. One is the usual reported cause. It is without a doubt that Pennsylvania heavily used the lyrics to communicate and drew inspiration from his personal life experience. With him having traces of the romantic Italian culture, it is possible that what Helga did to him was unbearable 
and for someone he regarded highly, someone who gave his life meaning no longer around, it became unbearable and chose to end it all, rather than suffer from the endless torture. 2. Is Helga's side of the story. Helga has been documented saying that she may not have been the cause of his demise. She even claimed that, I wish it would rain was written a year or so before things took a different turn and it had nothing to do with her. She said there were a lot of things that fueled Penzabeni's decision among them, his personal struggles like losing his vision after being hit by a baseball bat in the head when he was younger, forcing him to wear glasses almost all the time. Also, not getting the blessings of the parents in their union might have disoriented his peace of mind and always left him disturbed. Lastly, another fact is that Roger had a stepfather later in his years. This meant his parents might have undergone a divorce, which in some way may have added salt to the injury in his mystery. Helga even went ahead to say she was in the process of writing a book that would put everything to light and remove all the assumptions surrounding their story. She claimed she loved him to the core, with them sharing two lovely kids, and that's why she even retained the name Pensabeni, even after the death of Roger. Sadly, Helga succumbed to cancer in 2016, before she could fully give her side of the story through the book. Finally, many people who were close to him claimed that his father was frustrated from exploitation. People took advantage of his down-to-earth attitude to exploit his talent for their own selfish gain and to boost their ratings. They say he used figurative speech in his songs and that they were about his frustrations on how his music not being recognized, despite his creativity being embedded inside the work of his illustrious colleagues at Motown. Everyone drew inspiration from him. They say that the betrayal by his wife might have hurt him, but it wasn't fuel enough for him to take his own life. In fact, he was on the verge of breaking the code. On top of this, on the exploitation part, they say he was frustrated by the fact that most of his works wasn't credited. To prove this, they say he had a unique writing style, showing his love and affection through love. And that if you go through his works, and then compare with some of the great hits produced by the record label, you will evidently be able to point out his works at first glance. And as young as he was, he also wanted the hype that came with the tours. He was tired of being left behind and only being told stories of how his friends and team enjoyed themselves. Maybe if he had been tagged along in the tours he would have healed faster, and it would have even pushed his creative levels higher just by the experience. Regardless in any way you look at it, all these factors had an input in how things turned out to be, and it's in many ways so hard to pinpoint a specific reason that was solely responsible for his demise. It would be harsh to point fingers, especially when both parties are no longer with us to give us first-hand information. Ours is not to judge, but to appreciate this unique and one-in-a-century talent that went to unimaginable heights to ensure we enjoyed music, even if it meant mirroring his sad life to give us top-shelf ballads. Even when he was down in the pits he showed up, he set the standard so high that even to date, many artists still refer to his works as a blueprint. As much as it hurts that he died at a mere age of 22 years, let's be heavy on giving him his flowers for heeding to his call and not on the sad ending. The former outweighs the latter by miles. Last but not least, bear in mind that this is an old wound that we have reopened, not to scratch it, but to rightfully recognize his efforts. Keep the comments clean and uplifting so that those close to him, his old friends and family know how we feel about him. They were also left behind without proper answers and goodbyes. This is the least we could do for them. You may have departed before time, kiddo, but we will ensure that your efforts are never erased from the history books in generations to come, ever.